Good afternoon. Uh, morning. Sorry, I've been up early. Um, uh, get underway, and um, I'm going to uh, be here to chair the draft strategic directions chapter work, um, but that paper's still uh, due to arrive, um, and Vicky Buck's going to take over for me um, as I have some other matters to attend to. So, um, if if we can begin with the revision of the draft residential chapter. Well, perhaps, thank you, Madam Mayor. Perhaps if I just quickly run through the order um, with you, that might help. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so today's workshop is, and there are, it's a bit of a rats and mice one, plus uh, a substantial bit about the new neighbourhood provisions in the residential zone. But a lot of it is just bringing matters back to you that you've sought some direction or uh, clarification on. So we'll, we'll try and whistle through those. Quite a few uh, papers and things to be tabled or you should have in front of you. Uh, the vision statement, as you've just said, is coming. Um, we've got a, some residential, some revisions there. We'll be talking to you about the new neighbourhood, uh, which is a mixture of the residential and subdivision chapters, plus you've also got the section 32. So those will be already on your desk. Um, there's two matters in commercial to speak to. One is about the managing of effects of development in the commercial areas, and the one is the green building rule, which also overlaps into the industrial as well. And then the definitions. So what I thought we might uh, do with your leave is to start off with the industrial and commercial, because they should be quite short, and we can get rid of those quickly. Uh, and then as soon as the vision uh, statement arrives, we can look at that. Uh, the residential will take a little bit more. So if you're happy with that approach, uh, Madam Chair, we'll run with that. So what, what, what um, in terms of the um, strategic directions, yes. may in fact it be, do you think the vision statement? Yes. Um, do you think it might be better uh, if I simply come back at that time? So that might be better for, for you, for yep. ease of... That'll be fine. Let, let's just, if you're still here when it arrives, we can break and move into that immediately. Well, um, no, but I, I mean, none of go. us will have read it. Okay. So, um, That'd be fine. Uh, I mean, yeah, so, so maybe that's probably the best way to, to proceed, and then that won't disrupt that's the, fine. the flow. Cool. Thank, thank you very much. Um, the first two items are uh, industrial and commercial, and I'll hand over to Mark Stevenson to take you through those two things. Just make sure that they have the paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Right, uh, I'll start with commercial, and uh, one of the issues relates to the relationship between the transport chapters and the commercial chapters. Um, one of the issues raised in a previous workshop on the transport chapter was the um, location of um, cycle parking for visitors, um, as well as staff. Thank you. In Sorry, guys. No idea no, what we're talking about. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll Mark, start again. Mark, Mark's okay. just going to talk you through some uh, things you asked us to come back in terms of the commercial and the industrial Thank chapters. Thank you. Um, just starting with an issue that relates to both the transport chapters and the commercial chapter um, and was raised in the context of a, a workshop on the transport chapter, and that's um, the provision for visitor cycle parking um, in commercial areas. and. In the draft that you've received, the uh, commercial chapter requires uh, that new buildings, uh, shops for instance, are built up to the road front to encourage activity between the footpath and the private space. Um, and the transport chapter draft that you've seen required on those sites that shops are proposed uh, a requirement for cycle parking for visitors and staff. Now, that um, the difficulty with that it, is if cycle parking is provided, it would be to the rear of a building. And on a large block that's uh, long in, in terms of distance, um, if visitor cycle parking is to the rear of a shop and someone has to walk around the whole block to get into the shop if there's no rear entrance, it, um, it's not attractive to park some, one's bike in that location. And uh, arguably, you'd uh, park your bike on the street, on the footpath. and um, Given the importance of urban design and the key theme that's coming through in the commercial chapter to require build-up to the road front, um, 
and in discussions with David Faulkner, our draft tra transport chapter leader, we've proposed that the requirement for cycle parking for visitors is removed where a building is up to the road front, but, also, but still require that there's cycle parking to the rear for staff. So we're promoting, uh, requiring parking of, of bikes for staff to the rear and um, in those commercial areas, uh, we can explore options in the future as part of phase two to, uh, for example, um, taking contributions towards the provision of cycle parking on the footpath. Vic? Oh, I'm happy to be interrupted. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It does apply to it applies to any buildings uh, on on what we call key pedestrian frontages. So in the core of a in the core area of the commercial uh, zone of Rickerton, any buildings required to be built up the road front. Yeah, there's um, if if we, if we provided for that, um, that there, there is risks associated with such an approach. For instance, if the what started as a cafe changed hands and it became a dairy, um, you end up with a building set back which has dead space effectively because they're not able to utilise that space in front of uh, that shop and um, the retail sector um, that there can be quite a turnover of um, tenants. The difficulty with that is obviously the um, additional building that has to fill that space. Now, the, the reason we require buildings up to the road front is to en encourage greater interaction between the street and that shop space. And potentially you can have cafes with open French doors, which still achieves the indoor-outdoor flow. But Hugh uh, Nicholson, a principal advisor in our urban design team, can, is probably a better place to comment on. Uh, the, Look, I, I know it seems, you know, on the face of it, there's a, there's a conflict. But actually, in the in the central city now, it works reasonably well. So along Victoria Street, for example, we have people who, people are required to build to the street edge, um, and we and people come in and apply. We've had a couple of applications for people who want to have a space, an outdoor space for um, you know for cafes on the ground floor. So they've got an office building, you know, it might be five or six stories of office. Then they want you know what would, is obviously going to be hospitality on the ground floor, and um, and as part of the resource consent, we've we've agreed to that. So we permitted it. But um, but they have to they can't they can't simply set it back as a right they have to show us what what sort of structure they'll be putting you know they might one of them's got a structure over the top of this this little you know pergola over the top of the outdoor dining I mean I think it's a relatively you know sensible way of dealing with it it lets us talk to them about you know how they how how it um, relates to the street. So what's the activity? Um, the the um Bearing in mind that there's a consent requirement to assess the design of a new development over 250 square metres and uh, in a large area, in large commercial, in the majority of the commercial zones, um, uh, it's, it's restricted discretionary. But in addition to that, we've got a clause that doesn't that uh, requires that that application is not uh, publicly notified or limited notified because really it's assessing the design and 
to notify that to the wider public, um, you potentially end up with uh, additional costs. And so um, by removing that consenting uh, notification requirement, you're reducing the costs, potential costs of the consent process quite significantly because um, under the RMA, we're required to process um, those non-notified applications within 20 working days and there's not the costs of a hearing and the experts to attend the hearing as well as um, process in terms of uh, timeline. So it's a lot shorter time frame. So that can significantly reduce those. No, no, it's free. It's, it's, I don't know. Yep. <laughs> what? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, in terms of the frontages of buildings, what just what you described in relation to bicycle parking, it doesn't seem to me to cut the mustard at all in terms of our city being a cycle-friendly city and people being able to park their bikes, you know, adjacent to buildings in a, in a sensible place. Not that he, yeah, and and. Like we have, we have um, strong um, conditions for uh, consent for car parking. What, why aren't we doing applying the same kind of principle to bicycle parking? Uh, we're, 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 we're still promoting cycle parking, but there's other options to address that demand. Uh, for instance, taking one option we can explore is taking financial contributions, which council can then spend on the public on the. Paved area outside the store, which could include cycle stands, and rather than every single shop having cycle parking, you potentially have a communal. Arguably, you could have a communal uh, series of spaces that is better utilised by a range of shops rather than each individual shop being required to. That would work. You don't need one outside every shop, of course. Um, major, major shops. I think there should be space for. for Cycle stands, preferably covered. Yeah. But um, so, are you suggesting that the same way the main way council could achieve that is through the financial contributions? That's that's uh, one of the options that the, can be explored. Yeah. Is there any the principal? I mean, the staff have to they have to provide staff bicycle parks. Yeah. Everybody does. So that's you know a, you know a bottom line. So we're back. really just talking about the kind of the extra ones out the front. That's right. Of the. Or a lot of the larger stores, so when we see supermarkets and things, I mean, I don't expect those will be built across a full street frontage. You know, they're likely to have car parks. They're still likely to have car parks and cycle parks, you know, associated with their car parking areas to the side of the building. So um, I don't think it's quite as simple as ex we expect that nobody will be providing it. I think most of the major stores will still need to provide cycle parking for visitors in a relatively visible area. So that, that will be like a requirement, just as part of the so, car parking. So I think there's, I think yeah. there's three, three things um, that sort of brings it to a, the conversation to a bit of a conclusion. Is that, in terms of the, say for example, the Sydenham type parts of the city where people are seeking to redevelop, and you have got those small shops, then this rule doesn't work for those small shops. Uh, secondly, again, Sydenham and other areas have had master plans done for them, and as part of that master plan work. Uh, some of the ideas about what you actually do on the street in terms of making them more pedestrian and cycle friendly and putting in facilities for those. And then of course thirdly you've had David Falconer talking to you about the integrated transport assessments so for those bigger uh, developments that's where you can get definitely those uh, cycle parkings associated with those. So that, I think those are the three sort of key ideas coming forward. And on the last point we do have um, matters of discretion in the uh, commercial chapter to consider the um, cycle parking provision and so ensuring it's integrated with a, in a, within a larger development. Um, so just going back to uh, Councillor Goff's question of uh, comments, um, 
There's a number of um, benefits that are achieved through build up to the road front. Uh, Hugh's better qualified to comment on this than I, but um, walking down London Street in Sydney, for instance, pre earthquake, you had a sense of enclosure and a continuity of a street front, which, if it's, bro if it's broken with building set back, then you tend to lose that uh, feeling that you, as you walk down the street, uh, of uh, activity. and. There's also benefits of natural surveillance from a shop onto the street, but also um, it's buildings that get uh, set back, you uh, tend to see car parking on the front. So for, for instance, there's a restaurant on St. Asip Street, which has got a car park at the front and it's well set back. And you tend to have a less uh, conducive environment for, uh, and any pedestrian has to walk through a car park, which has issues of safety. <laughs> that, that, is, the idea. that is one option, but um, there's, Yep. There's, there's wider benefits, obviously, of um, okay. having built up to the road front. And that, and that was because that cafe that he's talking about, which is the Stray Dog, was actually a warehouse or something mm, quite Correct. different That's before. Not around having cafes, you know, or having lots of tables and everything outside. <coughs> on Man on, there were setbacks on Manchester Street. I don't know whether you recall before the yep. earthquake. So buildings had to be actually had to be set back by a couple of metres, mm. and we ended up with with areas of almost no no man's, mm. no person's land, you know, where, where really the shopkeepers weren't very interested in it. Mm. Just kept people away from their windows. It's and the... Totally up to the yeah, like, yeah. Anyway. Like, the business they wanted to, to make sense. Really. Jamie, we'll have that debate in a wee minute. I just want to get through the questions first. Andrew. Um, yeah, so talking about um, Sydenham, Colombo Street in Sydenham, London Street in Littleton would be another yes. very similar example um, where we've got um, a desire expressed from the community in the Littleton Master Plan and from memory I recall it being the same in the Sydenham Master Plan yeah. that they wanted a traditional streetscape with buildings built, built up to the, uh, to the pavement edge. Um, it's expressed in the... Um, <clears throat> The, the district plan review is 60% glass at ground floor yep. level, da da da. Correct. To have even so much as one building stepped back from the street would then alter that streetscape. And certainly in Littleton, there's a requirement for a veranda over the pavement as well. Well, that yes. wouldn't work with a step back building. Um, but th there is an issue with where the cycle parking would go in those situations because with the building built right up to the um, street front, there isn't space on the private land at the front unless you were going to put it on the pavement. Mm. And of course, a lot of businesses' solution to this has to been to, to lease land from the council and put tables and chairs on the yeah. pavement, which has worked quite well. So that actually addresses Jamie's point quite nicely with that um, leasing arrangement without the need for a building setback. Um, but the, the rear of the building, how would you imagine that would be handled in a situation where, you know, the rear of some of these small shops isn't a particularly public friendly place? Even for staff to be parking their bikes around there, there may be issues of safety with staff leaving late at night and that sort of thing. Um, is, is this something that you're, and I may have missed the beginning of the conversation because I arrived late and I'm sorry for that, but is that something where you would consider waiving the requirement for parking completely or would you require parking at the rear of the building, however impractical that might be? Uh, the, the proposed, uh, what's being put forward is to uh, remove requirement for visitor parking on a site where the building's up to the road front and so staff cycle parkings to the rear, but through good design, which is subject to an assessment as part of a resource consent, we can consider how that rear and uh, the environment to the rear of a shop is treated. Because I think, Councillor, again, using your Littleton example, there are rear, rear, rear of shops where access is very limited, uh, and that's part of the Littleton master plan, is to try and open those areas up to for access ways and behind, so those are the sort of things you'd consider in an application to say we physically can't provide it because we can't get access to the back of the building. There, there was an example where a landowner wanted to build his building back for a, a tenant of theirs to have cafe mm -hmm. uh, seating at the front, uh, but the requirement from building the building back meant they had to put the cycle parking in the front, yes. which is where they wanted to actually have their cafe. Yes. So there seems to be a, a bit a of an conflict. issue in conflict with what uh, Jamie's actually asking uh, and the parking requirement. H how do we overcome that or is there a, a, a way we can get around that? In the, uh, in the central city plan, um, you're right, there, there's a requirement. If, if a building set back, then the cycle parking requirement is there and that's something I, I um, need to raise is if, if we remove a cycle parking requirement where a building's up to the road front, then if it's set back, then arguably this space for cycle parking should... Um, I'm 
we're proposing that there is, like the central city, a requirement for cycle parking if they don't comply with this, this build up to the road front in that setback that they propose subject to meeting design. But isn't concerns. that surely against this whole act of front? The cycle parking right at the front of a building is going to really interfere uh, with the visual aspect of, the, of that ground floor. Mm. It's also going to interfere with that interaction on the space. It seems to me uh, a conflict in what we're trying to actually achieve. It's hardly building. to do with the scale of the space. I mean, if you could imagine a building set quite a long way back and with, a, with an area of car parking perhaps, you know, in front of it, that actually they, you know, you, that's quite appropriate for cycle parking. If you're trying to achieve a little sort of a narrow hospitality space, then perhaps that's not work. appropriate, I agree. And, and really the only way to manage that is, as we've talked about, is the restricted discretionary activity status. It's very hard, uh, well, not hard, it's difficult for us to write uh, rules for those sorts of exceptions. The exceptions are better handled through that restricted discretionary, non-notified, no written approvals. It's purely a matter that allows the council to say, OK, this is the situation you've got. What's the best solution? Is it better to have no cycle parking? Because it does exactly as you've talked about, councillor, ruins the whole frontage. And that's really the way to manage, we're suggesting is the way to manage that situation.